one day he came into the office and said something that seemed pretty innocuous at the time, but that would change my life forever. He said, I need you to serve drinks at my poker games tomorrow night. How many of you guys are poker players? I won't tell. Okay. I wasn't. I didn't know anything about poker. And so I went home and started Googling things like, what kind of music do poker players like to listen to? And what do they eat? And I made this really embarrassing playlist with songs like The Gambler on it. <laughs> I bought a cheese plate from the supermarket. And I went to this game and I waited for people to arrive. And I was figuring, you know, frat boyish, want to play poker, you know, in this, in, this, uh, in this dingy basement bar. So imagine my surprise when Ben Affleck and Leonardo DiCaprio and the heads of studios, heads of banks, and politicians walked into the room. Needless to say, I was pretty self-conscious about my playlist and cheese plate. But I had, a, I had a light bulb moment there. And what I realized was, this is an opportunity that a 22-year-old girl from Loveland, Colorado does not get. The opportunity to be in front of this network. I saw it as access to capital and power and information. And I wanted to stay. And at the end of the night, I made $3,000 for refilling some Diet Coke, so I was in. <laughs> so I went home and I learned, I studied poker. I studied the rules and the objectives of the game. And then I spent the next several months studying the client. I wanted to know why these guys, with their access to anyone and anything, why they wanted to come to this dingy basement with my cheap cheese plate and play poker. What I landed on is it wasn't so much about poker, it was about escapism and fantasy. They wanted to come into this room and feel like James Bond. They wanted to come in this room and be anyone and anywhere else. And so I built on that. I built on that fantasy. And I also forged alliances. And I f tried to solve problems that the players had that they didn't even ask me to solve. I was just going above and beyond. Um, and ultimately what happened is people took notice. And my boss got nervous. And he said he was taking the poker game from me. Um, and this was eight months after the game had started, and I was making a lot of money. And I also had started to see how to turn this into a business. And there was no way I could go back. There was no way I was going back to being his errand girl, being demeaned in the office. But that meant that I, at 22 years old, had to go up against a very rich, very powerful, very well-connected member of the Billionaire Boys Club. And I knew it was a long shot, if a shot at all. But you, take, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. I think Gretzky said that. So, um, so I decided I was going to take a shot. And I had a poker game. And I invited everyone except for him. And um, <laughs> I moved it into the presidential suite at the Four Seasons. I hired beautiful people and versed them on everyone's uh, drink order, the name of their kids, their position in life because I have found you don't ever underestimate the value of people feeling seen, heard, and remembered. And um, I raised the stakes because economics matter, particularly when we're talking about fantasy. It was a $50,000 buy-in. It was beautiful, and it was very well organized. And I said to them at the end of the night, I'll be hosting a game in this suite every Tuesday night. You guys are more than welcome to come. But so-and-so won't be here. <laughs> my boss. And it worked. They came with me. And so now I was the owner and operator of one of the biggest poker games in the country. And I was free to now implement the, the things that I thought that could take this to the next level, that could actually make it a business for me. Number one, this was a networking event. Movie deals were being made at this table. Hedge funds were being created. And I wanted more people that would add to this network. Number two, um, you know, I, I, I focused on aesthetic and I focused on people f feeling this personalized experience. Number three, I kept the stakes high. And now I needed to recruit more players. And it's not like I could really take out an ad or post something on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. This was an underground poker game. And so what I did is I came here and I cold called casino hosts that take care of the big whales, the big gamblers. And I said, look, I have a deal for you. 
I have some of the biggest gamblers in the, in the country, celebrities. I will bring them all to Vegas. I will introduce you. I will bring them, you know, we'll do games in the suites, and they'll come and they'll, and they'll wager millions of dollars on the floor, and it'll be a great weekend for you, and you'll have these new contacts. In exchange, I need the names, numbers, of the biggest poker games in the country biggest poker players in the country. And they gave it to me. And then I went around to the clubs in, in LA, and I said to the girls, look, here's a, here's a list of three questions. These questions will discern if these clients that are buying, you know, paying $100,000 in liquor are also gamblers. If they are, send them to me. I'll pay you a $1,000 finder's fee, and I'll pay, pay you a percentage each time they play. And so now I had a full game and a waiting list and basic laws of supply and demand. If you wanted to get invited back, you tip the host. So um, that business model made me a very rich woman. And I ran this game for six years in LA. But I had a silent partner, somebody who wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't an official partner, but it was someone who had a deep vested interest in this game. And this guy was a celebrity, an A-list celebrity. He's an actor, you've all seen him in movies, and it would shock you how obsessed he was with this poker game. And it wasn't just playing in it or winning in it. He liked preying on people and taking their money. He really got off on it, he called it crushing their souls. <laughs> that's fine, you know, not really my style, but uh, it's, that's fine. But what wasn't fine was he started to play really unfair and dirty, and eventually started to cheat. He was colluding with another player. And I had to shut that down. And I knew that going up against him was going to probably cost me a lot. But I had been empowered to run this game, and I wanted to run a fair game. And so when I found that out, I had to, t I had to shut it down. And it culminated in a very weird standoff. This guy said to me at the end of the night, here's a $1,000 chip for your fee but I want you to get on the desk and I want you to bark like a seal. And I said, no, thank you. And um, it was 30 minutes later and my face was bright red. Everyone at the table had start, stopped playing poker and they're watching this standoff. And I knew that this was not about a demand, uh, you know, this was not about $1,000 and, and barking like a seal. This was a demand for submission and compliance. And I couldn't do that. So I shut it down.